There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Mania. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another book haul. I have this collection of poetry by the recent Nobel laureate Louise Gluck, Poems 1992 to 2015. I purchased this just after she got the award. I had her, knew her name and nothing else when she was awarded the prize and read a few poems of hers online thereafter and then picked up this massive collected poems and it looks really, really good. Let me just share one poem for you, more or less at random. It is called Scraps. We had codes in our house, like locks. They said, we never lock our door to you, and never did. Their bed stood spotless as a tub. I passed it every day for 20 years until I went my way. My chore was marking time, gluing relics into books. I saw myself at seven, learning distance at my mother's knee. My favorite snapshot of my father shows him pushing 40 and lyrical, above his firstborn's empty face, the usual miracle. Many of you know that I have recently been doing a lot of reading about Indigenous Canadian politics and history, and here is a short little book that I found out about in one of the other books. I actually can't remember now where I found out about it, but I ordered it as soon as I knew it existed, and it is called Towards a Prairie Atonement by Trevor Harriet. Trevor Harriet is not an Indigenous writer. He is a prairie naturalist, lives in Regina, and this is a non-fiction book. It's about uh, one of the many crimes against humanity that Can white Canadians and white Canadian governments have perpetrated over the centuries against Indigenous peoples whose lands we stole from them. And this one is set in Manitoba in the community called St. Madeline, which was a Métis community. And in 1938, the Métis people from that community returned from working away and found their homes had been burnt to the ground and their animals shot. And the land that they had been given decades before had been taken by the federal government. That's all I know, but that was enough to say I want to read this because there is an aspect of atoning for that and that in more recent decades, white settlers and perhaps uh, Canadian governments, uh, political, provincial or federal, uh, took steps to right the wrongs that had been committed within the lifetimes of our grandparents, and I want to know about it. So I got this short little book of social, political, natural history. I don't know the what the natural history part of it is. I don't know how it all fits together. And that's why I want to read the book. I'm actually going to be doing a buddy read of this with my dear friend, Lindy. Here is another NYRB book book. I don't know how to pronounce this title. <laughs> Casabia. Casabier Takes Berlin by Gabriel... Turget? Gabriel Turget. Gabriele Turget. By Gabriel Turget. Translated from the German by Sophie Duvernoy. And I can't remember exactly why. I have been participating in the 2020 reading challenge set for us on Booktube by Britta Bowler and Mel of Mel's Bookland Adventures. May her channel rest in peace. I'm sure she will come back to us eventually. And I have read a fair number of German titles for the Read More German Books book challenge. Didn't get to all the ones on my TBR and afterwards acquired this one. Set in Berlin, 1930, portraying a society declining into fascism. Turgut, born 1894, died 1982, was from a family of German-Jewish industrialists. So we all know, sadly, that didn't end well. Uh, sounds fascinating. Um, the name Kaz Beer means literally cheese and beer. And the protagonist is an unglamorous man who used to perform on a shabby stage for laborers, secretaries, and shopkeepers until the press showed up. It would take me about an hour to practice the pronunciation for all the place names and street names in the opening sentence, so I won't take that time, but this sounds great. 
History of My Brief Body by Billy Ray Belcourt. This is a collection of essays, which a lot of people say is a memoir, but I watched Belcourt on some Zoom public video, video chat recently say that, no, it's essays, damn it, but I guess they're autobiographical essays. Recently published, it's on the bestsellers list in Canada, I believe, published this year. Now, I saw him on that Montana literary festival or something if, if it's still publicly available i'll put a link in the show notes but that i got a crush on him because he's just a beautiful gay voice he's an indigenous poet an essayist and academic who lives in canada and i hadn't seen him or experienced anything read anything or anything by him and I, but i had some stuff so i had a book of his poetry that i read after that but i got such a crush on him from his presentation and then i read the poetry and I didn't like it at all. But friends have told me that his first book of poetry, this the one that I read and didn't like, was his second book of poetry, and it just read like abstruse Foucault, peppered with references to Foucault and Judith Butler, and I mean, fine, but that's not poetry, and it wasn't poetry. But apparently his first book of poetry is supposed to be really fantastic, and this is supposed to be really fantastic. So I will get to this one soon and rekindle my crush on Billy. Belcourt. Um, I, I couldn't find any help for the pronunciation, but I think this Cree word for grandmother, it means my grandmother, is Nukum. If anybody can help me and correct me, please do. I couldn't find anything online. So, opening paragraph. This isn't a book about you, Nukum. A book about you, a book in which you appear uncomplicatedly in a world of your own making, is an anti-nation undertaking. Canada is in the way of that book. To write that book, I would need to write crookedly and while on the run. I would need to write my way out of a map and onto the land. For now, you move in and out of my books as though wind in a photograph. I swear no one will mistake you for a deflated balloon hanging from my fist. Here, and in my poetry, you're always looking up at the sky, longing for the future. In order to remember you as a practitioner of the utopian, I need to honor the intimacies of the unwritten. This book, then, is as much an ode to you as it is to the world to come. In the world to come, your voice reminds those in your orbit that we can stop running, that we've already stopped running. Okay, most of that I found really beautiful. There was a couple phrases there that reminded me of what I didn't love about his poetry, but I found it quite moving and fabulously political. Uh, in the last week or so, I have published my review of the 1956 British novel, The Long View, by Elizabeth Jane Howard. That was a buddy read with Leah from Calgary. The Long View is Elizabeth Jane Howard's second novel. We loved it so much, we're going back to read her debut from 1950, The Beautiful Visit. Can't wait. I think we're going to do it next year, 2021. I believe the protagonist is an adolescent woman growing up around the time of World War One, Stay tuned. You may have seen, I hope if you didn't, I'm going to put a link in the show notes, a Zoom chat I did with Jotsna of Jotsna's Bookscapades about all things bookish, especially related to Indian literature. And this was one that I saw that she added to her TBR on Goodreads, and I promptly ordered a copy myself. And it was really expensive, but I when I got this, I was spending in a ridiculous amount of money on buying books to kind of make myself feel better during the the intense phase of the pandemic earlier this year. So what the hell? You only live once, right? So this is an Indian novel, Six Acres and a Third, by Fakir Mohan Senapati, published in the 19th century. Senapati was born in 1843, died in 1918. Originally published in 1901. The story depicts Indian village life under colonial rule set in the province of Orissa in the 1830s. That sounds fabulous. Senatapi is described on the back as one of the pioneering spirits of modern Indian literature and an early activist in the fight against the destructive of native Indian languages. So there's some language in this opening paragraph. I don't think I'm going to read the full opening paragraph, but several sentences of it. And there is a word that is ekadasi, which in context seems like it means a spiritual or religious holiday. 
That being said, let's see what this sounds like. Ramachandra Mangaraj was a zamindar, a rural landlord, and a prominent moneylender as well, though his transactions in grain far exceeded those in cash. For an area of four kos around, no one else's business had much influence. He was a very pious man indeed. There are 24 ekadasis in a year. Even if there had been 40 such holy days, he would have observed every single one. This is indisputable. Every Akadasi he fasted, taking nothing but water and a few leaves of the sacred basil plant for the entire day. Just the other afternoon, though, Mangaraja's barber, Jaga, let it slip that on the evenings of Akadasi, a large pot of milk, some bananas, and a small quantity of kai and nabata are placed in the master's bedroom. It's not there, but I want to read more. Everybody and their dog knows that Ya Gassi's second novel was recently published, and I had to go to fairly significant lengths to get a copy of this edition because I love the cover. I had to settle for this stupid badge being printed on the cover. I hate that, but couldn't do anything about that. This is the this is the American edition, and I wasn't crazy about the British cover. It's Transcendent Kingdom by Ya Gassi, twenty twenty. She, of course, is the author of Homegoing, which I absolutely loved. And this is set in America, a Ghanaian family in the contemporary South. This was on my 2020 new releases I want to read, so I've got it. I don't think I'll get reading it until next year, but it's a kind of fabulous uh, deckled edges. I know how much some of you love and how some of you hate that. Uh, so I got this from Blackwell. Online, Blackwell, uh, Greg of Supposedly Fun brought it to my attention that Blackwell delivers anywhere in the world from their online store. Shipping is free. So just like Book Depository, and I'm kind of anxious to get away from always buying books from Book Depository. So this was the first one I bought from them, and it worked just like, just as good as maybe a, a week longer it took to get here, but I didn't care about that. I will be giving them more and more of my online book buying business in the future. Opening paragraph. Whenever I think of my mother, I picture a queen-size bed with her lying in it, a practiced stillness filling the room. For months on end, she colonized that bed like a virus, the first time when I was a child, and then again when I was a graduate student. The first time, I was sent to Ghana to wait her out. While there, I was walking through Kijedia Market with my aunt when she grabbed my arm and pointed. Look, a crazy person, she said in tweed. Do you see? A crazy person. Next, this was a book that I found out about. Somebody mentioned it on Twitter, and I looked it up. It sounded interesting, and I ordered it right away. The Coffer Dams by Kamala Markandaya. So this is an Indian novel, and Markandaya died in 2004, aged about 80. She was born in Mysore, India. First started writing in the 1950s, and her first novel... Nectar in a Sieve was an international bestseller. Uh, this novel, The Coffer Dams, was originally published in 1969 and now reprinted from Hope Road Publishing. And it is about the founder and head of a firm of international engineers who arrives in India with his young wife to build a dam. And it's about the challenge of building the dam and about the colonialist aspect with British bosses and Indian workers. So a social novel, if ever there was one, and that sounds fascinating. Here is another NYRB book, and this one I did a reaction video to some article that was kind of a listicle on LitHub about 13 bo strange books that you should read or something and there wasn't very much on that list I'll put a link to that video that I did that reaction video in the show notes but the one of the ones that it brought in I knew of it, this book's existence but I didn't know how much of a Sean book it sounded like it would that it ended up sounding like it would be and that was Cassandra at the Wedding by Dorothy Baker here is the other NYRB cover for the same book but it's not available anywhere so I settled for for this one, which is fine, but that one is really quite striking. It's not often I s seek out books with naked women on the cover, but that I thought that was fabulous. Anyway, this is a lesbian novel. 
a tragic comic novella. It's just over 200 pages. From 1962, Cassandra goes home to her family ranch in the foothills of the Sierras to attend the wedding of her identical twin, Judith. And Cassandra is a lesbian. That just sounds like such a Sean book. And finally, I think I heard about this on Kendra Winchester's podcast, uh, Reading Women, a novel by an indigenous writer from America, Even As We Breathe, by Annette Sanu Clapsaddle. Clapsaddle is a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. I don't know where she lives. She's on the board of trustees for the North Carolina Writers Network, so probably that's she lives somewhere around there. And I think it's her debut novel. And it's about a 19-year-old indigenous protagonist, County Sequoia, who yearns to escape his hometown of Cherokee, North Carolina. I will put a link to Kendra's interview with the author in the show notes. That's it for this book haul. Pretty good, hey? Thanks for watching.